so on the topic of problems that have been around for at least 25 years, uh, copy avoidance is not exactly a new problem. Um, we, uh, if I just show a simple example of a NetPerf uh, TCP stream um, being recorded by Perf. And if you only look at the process cycles, four out of five cycles are uh, spent copying data from user space to the kernel. Now, obviously, this is just a, a micro benchmark. NetPerf is not really doing anything. And it's only um, process cycles, whereas if you look at the entire system, more cycles will be spent elsewhere. Um, but uh, I had customers coming to me with uh, basically their own perf showing the same or results, slumped lower, uh, uh, s source of overhead, but quite substantial, um, and with legacy applications that they would like to convert to avoiding copying. Um, so at the end of the talk, we'll look at a couple of like real applications and the savings we got there. Um, the spoiler, they're not going to be 80%. Uh, so copy avoidance in Linux is not at all new. Before I introduced this mes message zero copy that I sent as patch set about a month ago, uh, we'll look at three existing implementations in Linux, uh, not just for historical overview, but because I'm going to reuse a lot of the existing infrastructure. So the first one is a well-known send file system call, uh, originally just to send data from the page cache directly to uh, a network socket without first having to copy it with receive or with read up to user space and then send it back into the kernel. Um, the implementation, if you look at, I think this is from a uh, TCP send page, uh, is what you would expect. Basically, uh, we, take, we, we look up the page in the page cache, take an extra reference, put it in the SKB frags array, and uh, mark the SKB or the shared infrastructure of the SKB where the frags are, are kept uh, with this um, shared frag bit. Um, now, uh, we have to be careful that we don't uh, change this data while it's being used by the, uh, by the stack. It is, obviously, we have a reference on the page, but um, it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't block any, anyone from changing the contents on the page. So normally, the network stack only cares about uh, headers, protocol headers, and those are not kept in the frags array. Those are kept in the SKB linear struct. Um, and the couple of cases where the network stack would actually touch um, data from the payload, um, there are these guards, as you see at the bottom, um, this SKB has shared frag, and then we just make a local copy. SKB linearize has the effect of uh, um, making the SKB have a local copy of all the data. And as a matter of fact, because this is expensive, um, the mechanism is actually disabled and replaced with a regular copy if these simple checks uh, fail initially. So these, these two checks are basically, does the uh, route out the device uh, support scatter gather, which is obviously, ne obviously necessary if you're going to uh, use the frags array, and uh, do we support hardware offload? Now, assuming like a normal network path, this is both true, and the data will get copied to the device before the device checksums the data. Um, so uh, even a change in uh, the page will not actually have an effect on, for instance, having a, an incorrect checksum. Um, send file can be generalized by splicing. So the idea of splicing uh, is that we treat kernel buffers, um, um, we, we, they can be accessed and, and moved around by file descriptors without having to copy data into user space and back into the kernel again. But unlike send file, it is not as restricted in what type of file descriptor, uh, what, what type of object hangs off the file descriptor. So one of these two file descriptors uh, has to be a pipe. This is actually no longer true in the interface, but conceptually it is. Uh, and data is always spliced from, say, a file to a pipe or a pipe to a socket and, and vice versa. Um, the semantics, whether it's actually a copy or a move, uh, are, are de determined by this flag. And um, for copy avoidance purposes, um, it's actually possible to get user data into one of these kernel buffers using VM splice. VM splice looks pretty similar to a, 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 um, a send message type call. It passes an IOVAC into the kernel. Um, and that IOVAC is built into a uh, Unix pipe that can then be moved to a network socket, say. If the flag gift is, is passed, um, this actually happens without copying. So this is shared data between user space and this kernel object. Um, and the same uh, issue uh, exists that if the data is modified, 
um, the modified bits might actually arrive on the wire. So the man page for VM Splice is pretty explicit about this. Uh, it's just not allowed to modify this page ever again. These are um, quite a constraint for, to, to program this way. There are some ways around. If you look online, um, there are some bad ways around this that are quite com common or at least suggested, which is, for instance, look when the TCP queue is empty with the uh, SIOC out queue. And if so, it's probably safe to reuse the data. Uh, it, is, it is not, because just because the queue is empty does not mean that the packet has left the machine. Um, it is also possible to just uh, unmap the page, which indeed uh, is okay, but it's not something you can do if you use malloc, say, uh, for, your, for your data. So you could you know, M remap the page, make a local copy, remap that back into the, the same address, um, but it's, it's definitely, it requires a lot of changes to your legacy application to use this. Uh, the third uh, copy avoidance mechanism actually shows a, a way to send completion notifications back to the sender when it's safe to reuse data. Uh, this is uh, specific to virtual machine networking. It's implemented in, uh, also in Zen, but I'm going to look at the Verdeo net path because I know that better. Um, so say normal send path, a packet goes out uh, the guest, it goes uh, through the virtual device driver, which uh, usually talks to a virtual device emulated uh, by the hypervisor, by QMU here, and QMU converts from virtual descriptors uh, into um, just an IO fact that it send messages, and it's not send, it's probably send message, uh, into the kernel, and this, uh, this, this tap device is bridged with the physical NIC. Uh, the first optimization that's not related to copy avoidance uh, is to take the hypervisor out of this data path um, otherwise, it's, you know, the data path is the same. The file descriptor is basically shared with the host kernel. The guest descriptors are mapped into the host kernel. And the host kernel uh, still calls the send message. It's just no longer a, a system call. It's now a function call within the kernel. So it's the same address space, obviously, on the side of the fee host def and on the side of the, uh, the tap device. Um, this, uh, Michael Zirkin, uh, introduced uh, this uh, zero copy support, and what he did was uh, when the vhost de device in the host kernel creates the IOVAC that it passes uh, through send message, it also attaches this control uh, data, which is a pretty straightforward structure with a callback function and some data to pass to the callback function when it's called. And you see the vhost version below. Um, so this is passed to send message, and if send message sees that, the uh, caller wants to use zero copy, um, it will avoid SQB copy data from iter, from iterator, um, and instead it uses message, uh, it uses the zero copy function, and similar to send file, it uh, tags the SQB with uh, a different flag this time, and it also hangs the structure off of the destructor arg, um, which is not a per SQB destructor arg, but for the shared info, uh, with the result that when the last user of this SKB shared info is destroyed uh, in SKB release data, um, the bit is checked, and if it's set, this callback is, is called, and, and vhost can do what it needs to do to notify the guest that it's uh, safe to, uh, uh, um, that its data has been sent, and also that it's safe to reuse the data. Um, so we're going to use this infrastructure. Um, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, one thing that is uh, a, a detail that's, that, that's important um, is we actually also have to call this callback if data is being copied when the caller asks for zero copy. Uh, because um, the, the caller will always, the, the sender will always have to be notified that its data is um, safe to be reused. And actually the RFC patch that I sent a few weeks ago, there are a couple of paths in the UDP case where this doesn't happen. So that's why I'm sort of sitting on, on sending it again. I need to fix those things. Um, so this is where the, uh, the new interface comes in, message zero copy. It is um, basically just a flag. It's implemented for uh, common sockets, TCP, UDP, raw packet sockets. Um, the upstream patch was uh, only for INET. I have INET 6 now too. Um, and it's implemented as a flag, not as a uh, socket option, because it's quite customary to want to combine copying and the zero copy operation. Uh, because you have to do notification processing um, on these zero copy requests, and also because 
Um, this copy avoidance involves page pinning, as we saw before. It is not free. And for very small writes, it's actually more expensive than just copying. So it's quite common to, for instance, want to copy protocol headers and then zero copy from a user space, uh, page cache, or something, uh, data out. Uh, another constraint, so in the top line, it is a, that it's implemented for communication with remote peers. And what it really means is only packets that leave the host uh, get to use this feature. Any packet that loop, that's looped back onto a local socket will get copied um, so that there are no pages pinned into memory that depend on a local process eventually reading it, which is like unbound latency. Um, um, so that's the, the, the main, main interface. Um, then what we didn't see before is a way to notify a user process that it is safe to reuse data. And for this, uh, we can actually use um, completions. There's already a very good completion interface. Uh, transmit completions um, uh, exist if for hardware timestamps, so, or in general for timestamps. When a, uh, a process sends out data and requests a timestamp to, to come back when the packet has been sent out, of course, it gets the timestamp, but at the same time, it ba basically just gets a notification that data has been sent out. And um, when TCP timestamping was introduced, it was pretty clear that the normal, the, the, the previous method of sending the packet back to user space with the timestamp was not very helpful because um, for, say, a raw packet, the, the, the packet is the same as the, the buffer sent in the original send call. With a TCP packet, it's not. The, the mapping from TCP send buffer to packet on the wire is, is very much non-trivial. Um, so these two options were added to the timestamping interface. One is that TS only basically does not bother to send the data back up to user space. It just um, sends an, an empty SKB, queues an empty SKB onto the error queue. And then ID, and that's the thing we're going to reuse here, um, associates a counter with every socket and every packet that's sent out of that socket that results in a transmit timestamp uh, will increment the counter and will associate the current value of the counter at send time with the SKB that will later be queued back. So that, um, to put it more simply, every send call will result in a timestamp with an incre incrementing counter. So it's, it's pretty easy to order your, uh, your sends. Now, a transmit timestamp is not a zero-copy timestamp for the same reason that um, the, the out queue trick of reading when TCP is done sending uh, is not safe. Just because a packet has left the machine does not mean that no other clone of that packet might be somewhere. And this is particularly true for TCP, which always keeps a clone on the retransmit queue when it sends out another clone on, uh, onto the wire. Um, so we'll get to that. Um, the interface itself is pretty straightforward. I took a bit of a shortcut in, uh, in error processing here. My apologies, uh, had to fit in the slide. Um, so you just add this flag, and as soon as this flag is added, the um, kernel has to send a notification when it's safe to reuse this data. Whether it copied or not is at this point immaterial. Um, it's processed the same way timestamps are processed. Uh, so read uh, from the error queue with, uh, with message error queue. Um, in this simple example, we'll do everything synchronously. I don't suggest anyone does this in real life. Uh, but in this case, uh, receive message is a non-blocking function. So we would have to basically pull and wait for pull error to be set or, or some other um, uh, blocking function. And then uh, reading the notification. Um, again, it's very similar to uh, other error processing. Um, check the, the, the um, control data for the right level and the right type, and particularly for this new origin, uh, origin zero copy. If that is set, then in this structure SOC extended error, which is not new, which has a number of fields that we can abuse now that we have a new origin, um, the EE data field will be this, this counter value that's associated with, when, with the, the send call. So if um, a socket is created and two send calls with uh, message zero copy are made, eventually uh, an error zero and an error one will, will be queued on this um, error queue. Um, that at least is a simple view. Uh, if we want to support sockets like TCP in particular, um, we have to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, first of all, we need to use notification ranges. So instead of just having EE data be 
uh, one value, what's actually returned is an, a, an inclusive range where EE info is the lower end of the range and EE data is the upper end of the range. And the reason for this is if you look, go back to a raw packet where the packet is basically exactly the same as the data on the wire, there's a one-to-one -one relationship, um, we, every send message call will create one SKB that's the entire packet. Uh, we create one of this, these UBUF info structures to get a call back. Um, we increment the per socket key, and we're done. But uh, for instance, when UD with UDP cork, we already have multiple send calls that map onto a single packet. Um, so that's why we need to return a range. Um, and with TCP, it's, it's more complicated than the UDP case even, uh, because TCP is a byte stream, it has no direct uh, relationship to, to packetization. There are a lot of things come into play, MTU size, you know, GSO, TSO support, um, auto corking, TSQ. Um, so what basically TCP does is it sees if, it looks if there is a packet already being queued for transmission, if that packet is smaller than the maximum size that it's allowed to be, and if so, it adds some data to that outstanding packet and it creates a new packet for the, the subsequent data. So we cannot just allocate a, a UBUF info for this system, uh, for this particular send call, um, because we might be appending data to an SKB that's already associated with the previous send call. And if that send call is a zero copy send call, we have to reuse that UARC. So that's what this um, realloc function does. Um, and as a result, a single uh, UBUF info, a single notification that's queued up to user space, may notify for a number of consecutive send calls. Um, the other way around is also true, particularly again with TCP, that a single send call can make multiple packets um, uh, because it can be many megabytes of data, much larger than the largest uh, network packet. Um, so we also added, have to add reference counting on these uh, structures. Um, if you see like this, this TCP send path sort of simplified here, um, TCP send message will create a, a number of SKBs each of which will take a reference on this notification structure so that the notification is queued only when all of them have been, uh, have, have been released. Um, then when it's sent out, TCP will basically keep one clone of the packet, the original packet, on the retransmit queue and create a separate clone and send it out. And then the original clone is released when the acknowledgement comes in. Um, the, the current implementation for TunTap uh, did not have to, this problem. So currently, any clone will, will cause a copy of the data. Um, so we had to change that. Um, so now clone basically does not take a copy, make a copy. It also doesn't have to take an extra reference count since all the clones share the same SKB shared infrastructure. Um, that's actually already handled. Um, then uh, TCP, when it actually sends out one of the two clones, can mangle the packet in, in many different ways. Um, one example is, is, is uh, if it passes a GSO path and it has to split a big packet into multiple MTU-sized packets, um, each of those has to point back again to the original uh, notification structure, so we increase the reference count. Uh, and then finally, when these MTU-sized packets are sent out, a packet socket might be interested in it, uh, say a TCP dump is, is reading all the packets. Um, that again causes a clone. Now, because a clone doesn't take a reference, uh, it doesn't increase the ref count, which is why I put it in red. Um, but actually, um, it doesn't even take a reference because this is one of the examples where a packet is being queued back onto the loopback socket. And I said, we're not allowed to queue these packets onto a local socket, so uh, a copy is made of the data. At which point, obviously, the benefit of zero copy goes out the window. It's, it's cheaper to make a copy in the send system call than doing it somewhere very, really deep in the stack. Um, so, a few uh, details about this notification processing itself. So, we, we uh, at some point, all the packets that uh, represent a buffer in a send system call have left the machine. Uh, it's time to queue the notification onto the error path. Um, the process is not allowed to use data until this notification comes in, so we cannot fail sending the notification. And for this reason, um, the notification SKB is allocated originally at the send call, not at the time we actually want to queue it, so that if for some reason memory pressure, notification, uh, sort of allocation fails, um, the entire uh, send original system call fails. And uh, so we allocate it at the same time as the UBUF info structure that's used during the lifetime of this request. 
Um, and a small optimization is that instead of allocating two structures, we actually allocate one because the smaller one fits into the SKB control block. Um, more important, um, sort of a subtle change, is that uh, we allocate this data not from uh, the TCP send, uh, TCP WMEM or, or TCP RMEM, uh, sorry, uh, SOC WMEM or SOC RMEM, uh, which could have uh, unintended effects on the uh, legacy applications who expect a certain send buffer size. Um, in particular for TCP, uh, TCP small queues uses this to paste TCP. So if we're going to allocate a lot of data uh, from uh, this uh, area, it could affect TSQ. Uh, so for that reason, it's actually allocated from OpMem instead. Um, and one nice result of having a notification that's a range as opposed to a, a scalar value is um, most data is sent out in order. The, the stack does its best to not reorder. Um, and with TCP in particular, data is acknowledged in order. We don't release data on selective acknowledgments, only uh, when it's fully acknowledged. Uh, so notifications will be queued in order. Uh, and instead of queuing, say, a notification 1, 1, followed by a notification 2, 3, we just um, change the first one to read 1, 3 and throw away the other notification. So in the common case, there will be uh, no more than one notification outstanding at any time, and the application can postpone reading notifications for as long as it's willing to essentially hold, a re uh, hold its, uh, its data uh, as read-only. Um, that, that greatly reduces notification processing versus having a one-to-one -one mapping of notification to send calls. Um, but at the cost of not being allowed to modify your memory, uh, while it hasn't been notified yet. So uh, pinning uh, shared memory in general will use less uh, memory, of course, than uh, having multiple copies of the same data around, uh, but we have to avoid some common problems. For one, the kernel, for integrity purposes, has to be able to set a limit on how much data a process can pin. So uh, processes are subject to the uh, U-limit on locked pages per user, not per process. Um, as I said before, we don't allow data to be pinned possibly indefinitely, so no looping back onto a local socket. Uh, and the process itself, um, in the, if independent of these, these kernel integrity protections, the process itself can basically stop using zero copy if it, it has too much data that it's not allowed to touch. That's problematic because it changes its performance profile, right? It's using this because it's more efficient and now we have this sort of bimodal behavior. Um, we can use the mremap trick that worked in, in send uh, file, which is also kind of uh, complex. Um, but this is for in the long tail of uh, situations that, that, that uh, like go bad, sockets that for some reason don't close. And uh, the last two points are actually something that uh, uh, I noticed while testing this in production. First, some clients are pretty poorly behaved. They keep these, they, they don't properly acknowledge the last data. They don't close their end of the socket. They just kind of disappear. Uh, so we had on a, a surface that um, talks to tens of thousands of clients. We had a few clients that, that basically uh, were, were dangling. Now, normally you would just close the socket and give up on this. Uh, but when you close the socket, you also close your error queue so you can never get notifications for this uh, user data to, that, it's allowed to, that you're allowed to reuse it. So instead, uh, it's possible to, uh, for, for connected sockets to disconnect the socket by calling connect an AF unspec. That will purge the retransmit queue, queue notifications onto the error queue, and uh, once all the user memory has basically uh, been notified, we can safely close the socket. Uh, the second one, uh, the, the last entry, uh, the second problem we observed in, in production was that uh, the application was queuing tens of gigabytes of, of data that it was not allowed to use for any other purpose anymore. Uh, and what turned out what was really happening is not that tens of gigabytes of data was pinned in the kernel. Um, this uh, append mechanism in um, uh, notifications that I showed in the TCP case was working a little bit too well. So every system call would notice that there was a packet waiting to be sent. So it would reuse that notification structure. It would then add more data than would fit in a single packet. Uh, so we would get a train of many tens of send calls associated with a single notification structure. 
And um, as a result, every socket would have, you know, it's like many megabytes of data basically uh, waiting for notification, even though they actually had been released by the kernel. It was just like one packet was, had not been acknowledged yet out of the 75 or so. Um, but as a result, on a system with tens of thousands of connections, tens of thousands of, uh, sorry, tens of gigabytes of data uh, was basically being held. So I added a byte limit into the uh, notification structure. Um, the result of that is when TCP tries to, uh, when a TCP send happens and it tries to append to an existing packet, if we would run file of this uh, notification byte limit, we actually don't append but create a new packet. Um, so we slightly change what packets on the wire will look like. I try to avoid this in general, uh, but that's the, that's the one case where um, I know that we might end up with sort of more packets on the wire and not perfectly sized packets on the wire because of zero copy. Um, the other problem uh, is, uh, of course, uh, uh, the shared, shared memory again. Uh, this is actually no different from the case in, uh, with SendPage. As I said, uh, copies, uh, headers are never copied. Uh, are never uh, sorry, shared. They're always in the linear section. And they're always copied. Uh, most uh, network stack um, access is only to headers. And in the cases where it isn't, we, we have the same check um, for scatter gather and hardware offload support. And there are a couple of points in the kernel, particularly now that programmable access with BPF becomes more common, more points in the kernel where we have to add protections um, and check whether there's shared data, and if so, make a copy. Uh, there. Now, what does all this buy us? Uh, this is again a NetPerf TCP stream, um, measuring both the cycles attributed to the process, which we saw before, and the uh, cycles of the, the two CPUs that do all the network processing uh, in total, um, comparing with copying and without copying uh, for different send sizes. And if you look at the process cycles the, the, um, uh, on the left, um, zero copy uses 41% of the process cycles versus copy-based STD for standard uh, at four kilobyte writes, but only 8% of the cycles at one, uh, mil, uh, one megabyte writes. So clearly it's more effective for larger writes. 8% um, is, 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 is really nice, but it's not what you can expect to save in reality if you take into account the cost of sort of TX completion processing and so. 61% uh, is what we, uh, what we saw. Uh, sort of end-to-end end -end for the same test. Um, so what does this mean for real applications? Oh, sorry. Uh, where does this come from? Sorry. Uh, so first we go back to that copy user generic string that's taking four out of five cycles. And now we look at the case with zero copy. Um, not only is the total event count much lower, um, what's left is our different functions, um, get user pages, that's got PTE range, is the function that actually pins the user pages at send call. Um, and the other two are, 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 are functions that uh, link these user pages into the SKB. Um, so clearly it's not, a, it's not free, right? You replace some cost with some other cost, so you have to use it wisely. Um, uh, so what, what is the effect we, we see at a larger scale? Uh, we've evaluated this with the open source uh, TensorFlow machine learning uh, framework. And um, with the version, the first version was not open source, I think with the distributed support. We use it with an internal RPC system. Um, but uh, we're planning to also support gRPC and currently uh, the open source TensorFlow uh, supports gRPC. Anyway, the RPC benchmark at two byte writes was actually worse. Um, but at 98 kilobyte writes, it's better, and 98 kilobyte is hardly an upper uh, limit on the type of sense that TensorFlow does. It sends many megabytes of data at once into the socket, so we should, we should be able to see better results. Uh, it's still a bit of a micro-benchmark. A uh, mixed workload saw a more realistic 7% end-to-end uh, -end cost, and at the scale at which we do machine learning at Google, that is uh, uh, considerable savings. Uh, the same for the, uh, the Google Global Cache, I think it's called, the, uh, basically serving uh, things like YouTube traffic. Um, peak QPS uh, go, goes up by about 7%. Um, the exception here is a storage application that was actually the one that originally came to me and asked for this. Uh, they do um, uh, integrity checks in user space, so they touch all the bytes in user space before they call send. And somewhat unsurprisingly, that means that all this data is in the cache at the time they do send. So they don't actually incur a lot of cost uh, 
uh, in the copy and the send call. Um, so this is sort of hardly outside the, the, the variance of the application. Um, so that's it. Uh, sort of a, a simple uh, copy of Windows mechanism for uh, legacy sockets that we can change existing applications. So far, these two examples, well, I changed all three, and only two were, were effective. We're not very hard to, uh, to change to, the, to use this interface. Okay. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> Um, that's great for things like your workloads where it's possible to go change the application. Is there some possible way to support this generically for applications that may, you may not have the ability to go set socket options on? So, sorry, what kind of applications? Suppose you had, I'll use one, a database company with some application that you may not even have the source for, so you can't go change the socket options. Okay, so the, um, I mean, all this sort of page pinning and page flipping tricks and so on hardly new. Um, if you want to do it transparently, you would do something, I guess, like, uh, like a page flipping, turning off uh, right access, and uh, it wasn't itch to scratch. I did it with this code. It, at that point, all the benefits for me went out the window. Okay. I think a lot of people have done this, and a lot of people have come to the same conclusion. Yep. I have some question about, uh, I don't remember exactly why you added the byte uh, limit on the notification, because in TCP stack we only acknowledge from the beginning of the queue, the retransmit, so the, there shouldn't be, if we have one notification in an oral queue, why should we limit it, the, the range of the notification? Um, well, so it's, it's up to the process to decide how often it wants to re read the error queue, um, but if we don't have the byte limit, it's not up to the process. Like all these send calls will basically be coalesced into a, a single notification struct. Oh, and that's at a send time, not a no notification. Yes. Time. Okay, okay. It's basically at send. We decide to not append to the previous SKB, but, but create a new one. Thank you. By the way, I did not have the thank you slide, but I'd like to thank Eric for giving a lot of feedback and finding a lot of these, uh, uh, pointing out a lot of the security issues that I had not addressed in the first version of the code. Hi, Michael Zirkin. So, um, when, when I worked on uh, ZeroCorp and Vihost, so um, one of the issues we saw and still didn't resolve properly was that, uh, especially if you configure non-working serving uh, queue disks, the packet get, can get stuck there for a very long time. And so if you're trying to do the zero copy, then that's, again, that's kind of unlimited uh, amount of time that packets can, get, get, can spend there. Um, so um, we did try to somehow poke at these queue disks, detect that packets, some zero copy packets are stuck there on a timer or something like this, okay. but never really did that properly, I wonder. So I think there's a difference between being stuck on a queue to a process and being stuck on a queue that's admin controlled and is part of the kernel in this regard. Um, uh, so yeah, but yeah, the queue disk is obviously there. Like trying to find um, all the potential clones that point to the same notification structure and then do a copy is, I don't think, feasible, if I'm honest, partially because it's just no way to do it atomically. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is an interesting problem. If the administrator comes up with a queue disk that for some reason is, as you say, it's not we're conserving and it can queue data indefinitely, um, then uh, probably zero copy is not a, uh, it's not good to expose zero copy to your processes in that case. Right, so uh, how about like trying again to do copy break somehow? Copy break? Yeah, I mean, you know, trying to catch these cases and, and do a copy before we get into the situation. So that means understanding which queue in a potentially complex queue disk hierarchy might not be serviced soon and then doing the copy there. Uh, I think that is very dependent on your queue disk uh, layout, right? There's really no way to uh, have that state available to kernel code that's easy to parse, I think. So, so it's going to be 
uh, at me independent how how does how does the app know that this there's a work uh, non work conserving scheduler in the I mean, it might even be the device is paused. Right? Uh, what's that? If the device is paused, that, that there's no way to know when it will be unpaused. Okay. Uh, anyway, we, we don't have much time. But yeah, as, you know, we can look into whether it's possible in, in to detect long, uh, like high latency in notifications, and then try to find the cause and do a copy on demand. But I've been very skeptical that that's that that's something we'll be able to solve. Uh, well, we're gonna cut it short here. Thanks. Whether well, there's a gift. Oh, huh. yeah. Thank you. Sorry for the other speakers. <laughs> uh,